So what is there for selection to do? Well, first of all, it's important to realize that even though we only have one of these guys on the program, maybe the most important person, and certainly more important than what everything I'm saying here today, is going to be Dick Alexander is batting cleanup for all of us. Uh, he doesn't do much of this stuff. He doesn't get invited out much. But we believe that markets are the continuation of selection by other means, right? I mean, at some level, we are humans, we are primates, and we are continuing to do what it is that we have always done, but we found a new way of doing it. So the core neoclassical model, homo economicus, is forever emerging from its abiological origin, right? At some level, physics and, and economics became deeply intertwined, and at some level, we did not fully incorporate the Darwinian five minutes. Okay. So the problem is it begins as a purely somatic creature with total fidelity to proximate preferences. We don't usually use multiple preference maps. It's been tried by people like Timur Karan, but in general, it's not something that we do frequently. We've got to correct for this because the current corrections are done piecemeal. It's not that they don't know that these models are wrong, but they're put in as anomalies. So what we are doing here today is to take on the challenge of trying to build a new model, Homo selectus, which recovers Homo economicus as a degenerate special case. Now I want to talk about how deeply far-reaching the move is from where we are to a selection-based model. It is very common to hear people enthusiastic about a little bit of evolution in their model. But evolution isn't a spike, right? It's a deep, deep commitment. Evolution, the way it's done today by our best people, is it not based upon the fact that it can do a little bit here and a little bit there, but it's a challenge that maybe everything comes from selection and that everything has to have an expression at that level. In that world, it is almost impossible for a biologist to work with a model which is at per perturbation on perfect information with rational expectations. You want to turn off the biologists, tell them that you expect that perfect information is a place to perturb around. Now, what do you see here on the left? You see an insect, a female wasp, sitting on a flower. Now you see a male wasp coming to mate. Except that flower, right, that petal was mimicking a female wasp. It was a wax museum replica of a female wasp. So this orchid, the mirror orchid, uh, grows this flower along with some pheromones, uh, this petal along with some pheromones, to deceive specifically this particular pollinator through a strategy known as pseudocopulation, and it's good enough to fool me, right? Now the fact is, is that you, thank God, <laughs> oi. This can only happen over generations and generations and generations. It is not the case that lying actors are quickly removed from the market and replaced by truthful ones. As Dick Alexander has said, it is the case that maybe all truth that we generate is initially constructed only uh, as camouflage for the few lies that we really, really want to tell, right? That's a very seditious idea. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you want to talk to somebody like Dick Alexander, you've got to start from a different perspective and you can't tell him how things are going to be from the beginning. We have to check with these guys. When we have conflict between our disciplines, I'm not saying Dick's right, maybe Dick's wrong. Let's go fight him. Let's have a disagreement. Let's figure out who's right and who's wrong because we're in the same territory. These fields have overlap and they don't agree. Let's figure out what's right and what's true. Next, theory of the family. I keep hearing about the free market. People are enthusiastic about the free market. There are very few things in life that cannot be improved with the introduction of a market but there are very few things that can't be ruined by freeing that market. What happens in a free market? There is only one, right? And it's the market for nutrients and protein and reproductive opportunities. So I thought you'd like to see some pictures of some boobies. This is the Nazca booby. The Nazca booby is seen here with its chicks. What are those chicks doing? They're engaged in the family activity known as obligate sibilocide or facultative brood reduction, I'm not sure which. So a close-up. Mama is watching one chick violently push the weaker second chick out of the nest and will watch it die when she could easily intercede to save it. 
It is not that we find Gary Becker and his theory of the family too mercenary or too unsentimental. The fact is, is that we understand just how far nature will go in order to be ruthlessly efficient. And in the original free market, there is undeniably a beauty and a majesty to the simplicity of the rules that govern. However, the barbarity of the market is unquestionable as well. And inviting a free market in to regulate human behavior is something that I think almost no one in society has the stomach to do. So we should be very honest with what we mean by free markets. Here is the mom, happy, tending her chick with the other one left to die. Let me lastly say uh, that one of the things that I want to do is I want to get rid of things that cannot possibly be understood uh, outside of neoclassical economics. There are certain places where the field goes for broke and decides that it's going to take a risk in order to make sure that it is dominant over all other sciences. And it is time for us in the harder sciences to step in and say, really, let's compete the ideas. When I found out that e economics was largely founded on the supposition that agents are homogeneous and that their preferences are in general unchanging, I could not believe my eyes. It did not make sense. And then I went around and people would tell me, oh, you don't have a solution to the changing preference problem because Gary proved that preferences don't change. Gary did nothing of the kind. It's time to have the argument. And it's time to have the argument with the Bob Trippers and Dick Alexanders of the world, and I'll do it if they won't. We cannot have these fields with different rules. We have to become interoperable. Let me just close because, OK. First of all, I want to say this is not a highly secretive program. We are not here to blow up the world. Perhaps it was a poor choice of words, Economic Manhattan Project. However, it is undeniably an important part of the physics culture. And aside from the product that it produced, it produced a bonding and a knowledge uh, in a community, which is what I was seeking to get at. So I'm going to stick with the analogy. But uh, our heart's in the right place. Just send email to economicmanhattanproject at gmail.com if you want to join. Tell us about what it is that you do well and how you want, might like to help. And we understand that everybody's busy. And we'll figure out what to do with these emails later and see if we gain some momentum and some steam. I thank you for your time.